So here we are, all set up for the game of Army Group Center, the opening blitz on Minsk. Uh, nothing left on the German force displays. The only units left on the Soviet are these which come in in the Stalin's fantasy scenario, just as some extra um, available units. We've got um, loss markers, regimental breakdown markers, um, destroyed bridge markers, and mode and disrupted markers here. There's also a bunch more in the box of those. Um, so you can see the Soviet units are quite scattered and um, they have closed up. I'm t playing the second scenario which is um, called Pavlov. Pavlov's Sunday. No, Pavlov's decision. So the first scenario you know, is called um, the Sunday Blur, and that's historical. I think it, the feeling for this game is that the uh, historical research is very accurate. So um, you have um, hex is provided for every unit at start, and um, a lot of them are at villages or towns or on roads. Some are actually kind of would have been off on tracks in, in, the, in marshes. And in the Sunday Blow, a lot of these, these are, the white ones are regimental units. So the brigades have been broken down into three of these. So three of these each is a brigade in the holding box there. And in the uh, Sunday Blow one, the historical one, nearly all of them are like this. They're one hex away from these um, entrenched positions. Simulating, I guess, that there was, they were in hiding uh, in preparation for Stalin's attack on the West. Um, yes, you can debate that <laughs> with me later if you like. Um, but I've heard it from three uh, different reputable sources now. Anyway, um, but th the point being, um, there would just have been sort of observation and minimal cause. Uh, although it was a defensive line, it wasn't fully manned. In uh, the second scenario, Pavlov's decision, you get a turn of movement. So in my turn of movement, I've closed up nearly all of those so that they are actually manning the defences. And there was a decision, should I actually do that? Should I withdraw them even further so that we can prepare ourselves later? But I thought, no, and just see how it goes. We'll make use of those entrenched positions at start. Otherwise, it might as well be that they're not there. Um, so... Uh, some units have drawn back because you can see there's quite a lot of stretching out. Now one thing that doesn't matter is, for example, there's a headquarters unit here and then his um, uh, brigades are, are kind of over here. And that doesn't matter. To be to, to, to gain um, combat support, they just have to be in a line of communication. So it doesn't really matter how far away your headquarters is, but it's quite interesting that headquarters... They actually have their movement marked. The other units, it depends on their mode. Headquarters tend to move quite slowly. You see it's two, two hexes or at best. Um, yeah, just two hexes a turn. Uh, so they're going to move back quite slowly. So I, I, I move back some headquarters and kind of coalesce some of their units closer around them just or onto rows just so that uh, it was more de decisive um, which core was, was guarding which area. So, for example, there's a, a core here which is going to be guarding Bialystok. So he's drawn in some. There's um, another that's going to guard Grudno there and so forth. So we've got the frontline regimental um, units and then we've got a kind of concentrations of defence there's, um, these units are all in uh, the Brest-Litovsk fortress here, the headquarters back there. And then um, some arrangement here. The other thing I had to do for the um, Soviets was to decide their mode. We have to do it for b both sides. For the Soviets, it was quite an awkward decision. They could either be at the start in prepared offence or mobile offence. That doesn't necessarily mean they're in offensive mode, but essentially it means that they're not in a stand defence um, or in a withdrawal. So they're not going to be in the best defensive mode, but I had to decide 
I had to make my decision, and the decision depended on a few things. One factor was the consideration. Um, if they're on preferred fence, they can be supported when attacking, so I thought, they, provided they have that communications line to their headquarters. Um, but they cannot exit enemy controlled hexes, so if I thought they might stay around, I put some in prepared offence. My other consideration was the fact that from prepared offence it's easier to go into reserve mode. And reserve mode you can move twice a turn once in the uh, enemy's turn. It's also quite easy to go into mobile offence if you have to roll that number or less on a d10, which goes from 0 to 9. Um, mobile offensive, it's quite easy to go into prepared offence if you want, but it's a lot easier than to go into transfer, so that and transfer means you can move quickly. So some I left in uh, mobile offensive. So um, uh, uh, in prepared offensive also you get a better casualty number. In mobile offensive you're more likely to get a casualty retreat and a disruption, but you do have a greater movement rate. So there's a bit of thought had to be dealt with there to decide what I'm going to do with the units and essentially it was such that um, for example the units here in Brest headquarters 28R so that's from the 4th army oh, there's a slight mistake there that M should be an R they're in prepared offensive so that might sound strange but they actually get be a better chance of not taking casualties they're actually so, so they're in here and around here, so I'm considering I want them to hold, whereas the others mostly um, a few scattered to hold, but mostly to be um, able to withdraw. And then uh, the twentieth army is all in uh, on the turn track, so they come in in transfer mode automatically as reinforcements. And the reserve unit there is always in reserve mode. So for the Germans, uh, similarly, the setup hexes are decided for me. Um, this is such as they are, some broken down to regiments there, so you can see they don't have a strong attack going on there. Um, so they're obviously thinking for a movement here and a movement here, some kind of pincer around here to capture uh, these uh, armies here. Um, which are the, t the 10th, 4th. And third armies with the, the 13th back there and the 20th in reserve um, ready to come on as reinforcements so but I did have the decision of what mode to put them in it could be any um, except these two which are coming in as reinforcements you've got a stack on game two and one there and a couple more there um, in transfer mode uh, so all of them I decided on mobile offensive except for the ones that will be attacking Brest and the Brest Litovsk Fortress which are going on to prepared offensive because they want that support. Now there's, uh, I said in my previous thing, I never had any problem when I played this once before with the Iraq and so forth, but I did have noticed two things. There's that minor um, misnaming over there. And then also this Panzer Group is listed as blue, but Panzer Group 3 are actually these town um, uh, uh, bars, under bars, there. Uh, that's that's minor, but then there's there's one more thing which I came across in the rules, and that is the overruns, and only units in mobile offensive can overrun. It says, it says uh, that, with the exception of armour superiority bonuses, no modifiers are applied to overrun attacks, and I found that surprising because combat modifiers include terrain, Okay, the, the, there's no mode modifier, no problems with subordination, uh, defenders mode, and combat support doesn't come in. Okay, I'm okay, I'll work with that, but surely for an overrun, terrain is all important. It's not going to be, you can't just ignore entrenchments when you're overrunning. Uh, so I think that is a, an oversight and a mistake in the rules, and I'm going to say terrain is counted as long as well as armor superiority bonuses in overruns. I think that's going to be key otherwise the Germans would just um, 
They could just be a mobile offensive all the time and take no notice of terrain in combat, only in movement. I, maybe that is a design feature and I got that wrong. Um, and I am going to ask a question, but the designer being Japanese, I don't think he's um, active on the, uh, the English speaking message boards, but we'll see. We'll see if I can get an answer to that. Um, but it's a shame I don't know that right now because I'm itching to start. I think I'll start anyway. And we'll see how it goes. So the first part of the first turn will be to decide um, which units of or air units are fighting for air superiority and which ones are heading for ground attacks or support including interdiction. It'll be interesting, you can see that Germans have more air. There is a thought that to hold back some um, Russian air uh, to come in later, but it's always a problem with these when you have less forces in air because you end up uh, in a dogfight, eventually you're just going to have none and, and they'll have some left. And that's it, that all your air have gone. Uh, but what can we do? <laughs> I don't know, it might be more critical to hold back the air. And you don't have to worry about your air considered, they're just abstract. You don't have to worry about the air being destroyed from the you know, air fields being attacked and so forth. I suppose they're significantly further away from the front than we have here. So this is just an abstraction of what is available. Um, although it will give the, and the, the the Russian goes first. So if the Russian puts none in, the German can put all of these on air interdiction. Hmm. And we do want a bit of withdrawal. So that that's going to be quite a decisive factor, in, in, uh, particularly in the beginning, while the Soviets still have some air left. And I'm tempted to do the Stalin's fantasy scenario and give them extra air units and a couple more reinforcements they have there. But to do that probably they would have another, the Soviets would have another free turn of movement. <coughs> um, and I, I want to leave them as they are now. Cause, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll head onwards with this uh, Pavlov's decision. He's decided to prepare for what he thinks is an imminent German attack. Germans are preparing to strike against the threat of communist takeover of at least Eastern and Central Europe. Let's see how they both do. Here's the situation, <coughs> excuse me, at the beginning of the game. On game turn one, we have... Um, the whole of the Russian 20th Army in reserve, ready to come on late in the day. We have um, the whole of the German 46th Panzer Corps in reserve and a couple more units and 47th Panzer and uh, um, some hodpodges to come in the next two uh, game turns. Now I've done a little bit of doctrine to the map. <coughs> uh, just uh, you see the boxes here indicate the third army, which is has a pink stripe at the bottom, and then <coughs> the eleventh M headquarters is grey. That's how you can tell its units from the, for example, the fourth R um, units with their. Uh, Pink stripes was I think they're all broken down into regiments. But anyway, you get the picture. So <coughs> you can locate the army quite quickly, but you can't necessarily locate these without squinting at what's written on the counters instead of just glancing for the um, colours. I've adjusted that on the German side. I will do it for the Russians when I get to them. So um, also there was a miscoloration here for Panzer Group Three. Essentially what we have is we have Panzer Group 3 here, um, the 9th Army here, 
And you can see they've got a thin screen of regimental units here. The rest are brigades and divisions, mostly divisions. Uh, then we have a fourth army here, the green stripes, and then these blue striped fellows is the Panzer Group 2. So obviously if the idea is for a classic pincer from those Panzer Groups. And uh, with that in mind, I've uh, put most of the units in mobile offensive. The ones that come on as reinforcements come on as transfers. The few that I have put as prepared offensive are, for example, this independent unit here. So he's going to take that out with some prepared um, attacks. And then these ones will hopefully be able to move through. Um, also in... Panzer Group 2, I've got the 12th and the 255th. Uh, the 255th, I just showed you. The 12th is yellow. So these fellows are all on prepared offensive as well. That's in preparation for attack on Brest Litovsk Fortress and all the units surrounding. Um, so these, these ones are on prepared offensive. These ones are going to be on mobile attack. Now it's very interesting. When I first set up, I had practically everybody on mobile attack. And then I started the first game turn, and then I noticed um, that the uh, combat is before movement. Now I knew that, but I hadn't really, you know, I hadn't played it, so I hadn't experienced it. So what that means is that if these units were on mobile t um, attack, they could fight in the combat phase. They could also fight again in their um, in the movement phase as overrun. However. They are not as effective at fighting in the uh, combat phase. They're more likely to take losses, and terrain counts. In the in overruns, terrain modifiers do not count, so it's better to hold them back from attack and let them just move. But what that meant was that I decided I needed more units on attack because I, I thought everyone would attack, uh, <coughs> and. I and mean, then be in mobile offensive, sort of move quickly. But because the attack comes first, the combat phase is first, I wanted to finish some attacks, get the units eliminated, and let others move around. So consequently, those and those are prepared attacks, and these ones are going to wait. They will not attack in the first phase. If there's any defenders left like that one will be, they will overrun them in the movement phase. Um, it, it's important as well that... that distinction because in between combat phase and movement phase the enemy gets a reserve a units in reserve mode can can move you can only move in reserve mode you have movement rating of three so you can't move really far necessarily and you don't get the road bonus with that but um if the russians were prepared and say they had you know headquarters here and some units here they could put those in reserve in between uh at the beginning, they don't have any units in reserve mode um, to uh, simulate the disorganisation, the unpreparedness, rather, that are for, for this um, attack. So, um, so in the 4th Army, we've just got the green 43rd. These are unprepared offensive. You can see to take out these defenders. And then the rest are on mobile. So they want to move out of here as quickly as possible. Uh, then in the 9th Army, they have a whole bunch of units here um, belonging to 42nd Panzer. And the 9th Army is all on mobile offensive. So they're going to be attempting overruns through through. Um, these gaps and so forth. Um, and in the third Panzer group, we only have 39th Panzer, which are the light blue ones, these ones. These ones are on prepared offensive. So they're going to stay back, blast a hold, and the rest are hopefully going to whiz through these light defenses. Um, you've got a stronger regiment there. Um, the weather is overcast, that means, only slightly, that means the air forces are not so effective. Um, I've already played out the air um, segment of the game turn, 
and essentially all, all that means is you line up uh, the sort of dog fighters in here against each other and you keep rolling until five rounds have gone or, or there's just one side left. So these are aborted, aborted, this one lost a step. Um, and so the, the Germans end up with air superiority which meant these ones could then go down and the Russians have got two um, flights here um, providing interdiction and barrage around here in support of the breast fortress and essentially they decided to concentrate the air here to clog up this major road and rail network um, to deny it to the Germans. So these ones were able to attempt to abort or, or, or take step losses on these. They didn't manage. But the Germans have some of their own bombers out here. Uh, one directly into the Brest Litovsk fortress. One actually all the way over here, hopefully to disrupt any movement around Minsk reinforcements. Some here, here, and here as well. So essentially, only this, these right on the front, the rest to try and um, delay and disrupt any uh, reinforcing units coming uh, towards the front. Or also, the thought here was to stop them moving away because we want to capture these units in the pocket. Um, if uh, a armour's worth. Um, four victory points to the Germans, five for the um, Russians. So if headquarters actually nothing, but there's a few armor in here. So there's kind of a cluster of victory points worth there, which is worth two thirds of the value of Minsk, and, you know, even more around here. So we want to capture and destroy some of that, um, those men and materials. So uh, on the Soviet side, you can see some fellows are on prepared offensive. What that means is they're not so much they're on the offensive, but um, they are less likely to take casualties um, uh, in combat. If they're on stand defense, um, they're less like even less like they they might take casualties, but they're less likely to. Um, retreat because here that you have a morale mod of 5-2 on stand offense it would be zero but also they have some movement better movement capability the rest are on mobile offensive again just so that they can bug out quite quickly um okay so that's where we stand at the beginning of the game so I just um i finished the air f air phase um this is the command control, and now we're going into the first combat phase. Okay, now for the first combat of the first turn, apart from the air combat. Um, it goes like this, we have this independent unit, strength 6. He's got a bracketed armour um, value, so the movement values are all on the, depend on the mode of the core, and uh, this independent unit has its own. He's in prepared offensive. But anyway, so he's got six combat value and one armor support value. If he's attacking with another armor, he can use that. Or uh, armor superiority value, sorry. If he's, or if he's defending. Um, regular armor units, it's unbracketed and they can just use it indiscriminately on attack and defense. So um, this fellow won't be able to. Now, he's six, but he's attacking across a river. So he's halved, which gives him three. He's attacking a unit with one strength, an infantry regiment. So the differential there is plus two. Now, he's attacking into a village. So instead of... What that means is we move... I'm not really going to be able to show you this. But we move, instead of from here, the clear, we move up to the woods village uh, differential. You can see everything's shifted, one to the detriment. So, um, it's essentially a, a column shift. So we're on, what did I say, plus two <coughs> on woods village. Then um, we check also... Uh, 
that there is um, entrenchments he's attacking across. So that's two to the left, to the detriment of the attacker. Uh, the attacker doesn't get any minus because of his mode. Like if he was in withdrawal, there would be another three shifts if you were trying to attack from withdrawal. Um, the defender's modes is if he was on stand, uh, that's not going to have an effect. The attacker's subordinate, so there's not two armies involved. Armour superiority, no. And then combat support, well, the independent doesn't get combat support. Um, but no worries. So we're on a net of zero on the Woods Village column. Now we're only going to get a decent result on a zero to three. <coughs> That's not so great. And I rolled a zero. Fantastic. <laughs> so that is a no loss, no effect to the attacker and a C result. That means we have to do a loss check. Um, so we check the morale of uh, the core of this unit, which is, which core is he from? He's, see, uh, he's from the 4th Army. And, okay, it's morale 6. Um, <coughs> and if we roll above that number, he's going to take a casualty. And I rolled a 4, so no, no casualty. Oh no, sorry, my mistake. I check his mode. So the mode for the casualty and the morale to see if he retreats. So he's not retreating, but we check his mode and he is in prepared offensive. So his casualty value is seven. So if I rolled over seven, he would get um, a casualty. And that is how the attack goes. I, I, I'll carry through so you can see some other examples. Now, oh, silly me, I should have added this fellow in. So, um, that would have added one more point, which would have just given us the same result, but with a one added to that die roll. Okay, now these two fellows then are going to be attacking against him. And they are in, um, they're in Panzer Group 2, and they are 24th Panzer. So they're in mobile offensive. They're not going to attack now. They will attack in the movement phase as overrun. Now this fellow is going to attack him. He's in um, prepared offensive, so he will get combat support. So still over the river, so we go down to a 3 against 2. And this fellow's not defending in any other decent terrain, so it's plus two in clear, but then two to the left because of the entrenchments. Now this fellow can get combat support from his headquarters. Headquarters combat support value is two, so that gives two more shifts. We go back up to plus two. Um, nothing for the modes. And armor superiority, we don't have. Ah, uh, those guys would have been able to do well on armor superiority. Maybe I should have attacked with them, but they'd be attacking through a forest. Uh, so we're on a plus two. And I rolled a die. I rolled a six which gives us uh, attacker one result. That's unfortunate, so I have to roll for the attacker, potential loss and retreat and disruption. So I rolled a three, which he's on prepared offensive, a casualty value of seven, and the morale of his um, German core is going to be uh, n uh, nine or 10 at this point in the game. The, the morale goes down as units are lost. For every two units lost completely, you lose a point of morale. Okay, so that was no effect. Um, then these fellows are going to... You, in Brest Litovsk Fortress is actually... You can move into that hex. You have a holding box. 
off here to put all those units in so these fellows will move in there next and I'll just go back here see what what this how this attack would have worked out maybe I will do it and even though they're in mobile offensive mode so we have seven and six so that's 13 halved is down to six versus one and they're attacking woods so it's plus five but then they have armor superiority of six so we're going right up to the best column um, in that and there's going to be no attack loss there so they will in fact take that attack considering they've got such great armor superiority Ah, no, but our superiority does not apply ah, against forest, swamp, polish or city. And that's just woods, not a forest. So it, it does apply. And I rolled a one. The worst I could roll, but... Oh, no, that's, that's better for the attacker to roll low. Okay, so that's a four result, which means I roll the die. And he's on mobile offensive. So he's on casualty value of five. No, sorry, prepared offensive casualty value of seven and six plus four is ten. So he's going to take a step loss and he only has one step. So that is gone and one of these attackers can advance. Okay. So there's nothing more interesting to happen around there. When movement happens, we, we will check for air interdiction, which might cause disruption of the units attempting to move into here. Um, they might not actually do it. I think they might go around the fortress. Um, so I will carry on. But basically, you see, that's how combat works, very simply. And you might think it's a bit, um, oh, why do you have these, you, you roll for attack and then you roll for the loss checks and the same roll counts for the retreat. Well, the designer says that one reason he did that is is to stop the thing whereby you would have a stack of an armour unit and an infantry unit and if you have to take a step loss you would automatically take it off the infantry unit. Uh, he said, it, so, you know, you're just kind of... Um, sending round army units with infantry units to soak off the attacks in a very sort of gamey situation. This way you have to roll to check for loss for both units so you don't know which one might take it. They might both take it as well. So you can't just um, preserve uh, your better units um, in, in, a, in a gamey manner like that. And I think it works fine. It, it, it happens quickly because um, you know, there's not a lot of checking to do, and it's very simple, um, clean system. You don't have to check up several charts. There's just one chart with various shifts, and the math's easy instead of working out its differentials instead of trying to work out ratios. Just a quick video here to show you how overrun attack works. Now, this unit uh, is not in mobile offensive. These ones are... So they can attempt to overrun this fellow. Now the interesting thing is that uh, you can ignore the uh, entrenched positions uh, or um, uh, these improved positions back here. <clears throat> but um, and despite what I said in my introductory video to this game, terrain does still come into effect because I was thinking, silly me, um, you have uh, combat modifiers here and they call this one terrain. So in my mind I was thinking, uh, you know, that shifts on here. But uh, in actual fact, terrain is taken into account in the column which you do it on. So uh, uh, although to, uh, in um, overrun combat, 
none of these combat modifiers have effect except armor superiority. So what that effect means is that it doesn't matter what mode, if you're um, combining different core, etc., you get no combat support from your headquarters. None of those have an effect except if your armor <coughs> or your defending as armor that's going to come into effect so terrain does happen because it depends on the column it's not a combat modifier so that is the distinction which i missed um in my explanation so i have to scratch what what i was saying and it's already baked into the rules it's fine so essentially what happens that that unit there is uh defending um it was unsuccessfully attacked um in the combat phase by this now uh, we had the reserve phase, a uh, few Soviet units moved, but none into the front line. And that's the movement phase. So <clears throat> they have to expend um, all their regular movement points, plus two for overall combat. Being in mobile offensive, they get eight movement points. Um, it's actually going to cost them six to move into there. Oh, hang on a minute, they're moving over a river. I forgot that. So they're moving into clear is one. Um, but they can be attacking across that bridge. Okay, so one of them... Okay, and the, the entrenchment does count for their movement cost. That won't count in the actual defence. Um, role but basically even if you don't have enough um, movement points you can always move one hex so they can move into there and um, you, you just add up their normal modifiers uh, and it is going to be halved because they are attacking across a river because that's not a combat modifier um, so that Strength is, combined strength is 9, half goes down to 4, so they're on the plus 3 column against woods or village, and then they have um, three, three, four points of armour superiority, and the defender has none, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, <coughs> and they uh, rolled a 6, which is... Um, it requires a roll plus one and the roll is eight so this one even in prepared um, offensive of a casualty value of seven loses a step and would have had to retreat disrupted so he has gone and then these move into the hex uh, and because they're cross river they don't have enough movement to move any further but if they did they could I guess to continue with the example of movement, uh, this unit um, is able to move up around here. It'd be, it's, they're both motorised, so it would be two points here. If it went here, it would have to stop and in the enemy zone of control. Three here, so it could go another two here. It would be five for this Poleshi hex, which is mixed woods and swamp. Um, however, if it did go up to here, it would be within three hexes of this unit which is air interdicting that's not interfered with by the German unit which will pre perform in the same function too in which case I would roll the d10 and if it's lower than the interdiction stroke barrage value of 4 there then this these roll for each one these units will become disrupted and have to stop movement a disruption comes off at the end of your turn but you don't want to be attacked in disruption because you're Quite likely to take a loss if uh, it's a successful attack so I'm not going to risk that this fellow is going to go one two and then five there's seven he's in mobile offensive so he gets eight movement points now contrarily this guy's in prepared offensive um, he had an unsuccessful attack against that fellow he can move uh, no, sorry, he's in prepared offences, so he cannot exit an enemy-controlled hex. If he did, anyway, he would only have four movement points, um, in which he could potentially go there, um, and no further, because the river would be two movement points in 
plus two and the entrenchments plus one. So anyway, he's not moving. If one were to move out of an enemy um, zone of control, it costs half of your um, movement points, fractions rounded down.